All right, folks, and welcome to another alumni chat series session. Today, I'm very excited to interview our former alumni uh, series host, Aditya Shah, who is now a full-time analyst at Hula Hamlaki in their valuation group. So again, I'm very excited to actually welcome back uh, Aditya because now the roles are reversed. He's now in the hot seat and I get to ask him some questions. So uh, Aditya, thanks for doing this. How are you? I'm good, uh, but first of all, Mr. Romero, as a host, you have big shoes to fill in. I just want to say that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but I've been great. Uh, good amount of work coming in, uh, coming to my way. So uh, busy with that. Uh, started with Hulahan in July. I had a month of training in New York. Uh, met a, met great people, really smart people over there. Um, but yeah. Now it's quarter three, showtime starts now. I know. I, I know it must be an exciting uh, part of your, your journey and your career since you're entering the professional world. Yeah. So why don't you tell us a little bit more about uh, the recruiting process? What was that like transitioning from an undergraduate student, interviewing, recruiting, and, and finally receiving your full-time offer at Fulahan Lati? Tell us a little bit more about that experience. So uh, first things first, it's really hard, as many college students uh, must be going, must be facing. Uh, it's one of the hardest things, uh, to, you know, because it's such a competitive industry. Um, everybody who applies into this industry is very, very smart people. Uh, they know how to talk. They know how to sell themselves. Uh, they they go to great schools, even if they don't go to great schools. Um, they 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 know ins and outs of the finance industry. So. Be ready for, uh, you know, a tough, tough period, because uh, if you can handle this, then uh, it's sure that you'll be able to handle the pressures which uh, come when you enter the finance world. But as for the recruiting process, uh, uh, it's basically like networking with uh, people within the firm, actually understanding what you really want, uh, because all these firms, you know, have uh, gloriously described their jobs. But after you, once you speak to the people who are actually doing it, that's when you get to know uh, the true sense of uh, how the job is, and if you uh, and if your personality traits match with the job description. Um, connect with a lot of uh, people at the at the firms with where you're applying. Uh, grow your technical skills because it's sure that your interviews will have uh, technical questions. Uh, almost everyone does. Um, and most importantly, I think it's behaviorals, which are really, really important because when you're stuck at the office at 2 a.m. at night, uh, you want to be sitting next to a person who you would like to have fun with, you know, who you like to talk to. Because if you do not like the person who's sitting next to you, your job is going to be miserable. So that's what most most banks or most companies in the finance world look for is if, if the people who they're hiring match their culture and if they're good people to just, you know, uh, work with. So, yeah. Okay, okay. I mean, th th there's a lot to unpack there. Um, I think one of the important points that you've mentioned that I constantly emphasize to students that apply to the analyst prep and that I get to speak to and, and share uh, some of my own even experiences that you have to be ready for the industry that you're really applying to and to give you some concrete examples, the type of candidate that usually pursue these type of opportunities, whether it may be investment banking, uh, equity research, private equity, hedge fund, you're stepping into a world that is filled with highly motivated, highly competitive, extremely driven individuals. Many of these individuals were valid Victorians. They had perfect SAT scores are very active on student clubs. Many of them are presidents in one way or another may hold uh, uh, officer positions in student clubs. Some of them are also student athletes. So for those of you that are really interested in a career in finance, investment banking, you have to understand your competition. And then you have to take matters into your hands and do whatever you can to prepare yourself. I did you mention, you know, that, that understanding the technical skills is also important, but also knowing your personality, right? Because cultural fit 
within the firm and the group that you're going to be working at is very important. You also mentioned, Aditya, that, you know, making sure that the person that might be sitting next to you at the office, if you're staying late at 2 a.m. in the morning, uh, making sure that you can get along with that person and probably talk about topics outside of work is also very important. Yes. Uh, this would lead me into my next question. You know, why don't you tell us a little bit more about your, what does a day-to-day look like for you? What time you wake up till what time you, you, you get to the office? What is your responsibility throughout the day? And then at what time you go home? So t- tell us a little bit more about the actual uh, experience of evaluation analysts. So uh, typically for portfolio evaluation, uh, it's a little different from investment banking. Um, our uh, main time, uh, actual amount of workload we get during quarters, like two to three weeks before quarter ends and two to three weeks after quarter starts. Um, so now, we, since we're approaching quarter three, we're full hands-on with our work. Um, so typically, we I wake up around uh, 8, 8.15ish, uh, get to the office by 9 uh, as soon as I hit the desk. A uh, typical routine, which I like to do personally, is just glance over the Wall Street Journal uh, so that I'm up to date with the markets, uh, with what's going around the world, because it's just a nice conversation to have uh, with people around you. And, you know, just in general, your MDs, if, if you if you sort of uh, tell them about what's going on in the market and how it could relate to what you're doing, they like that. Um, they just They just seem to know that you're updated, which is nice. And it's just a nice thing because you're in this industry to, you know, be updated on certain things. Um, then after that, um, if there are calls scheduled with associates to, you know, go over the models, or if there are client calls uh, scheduled to, you know, give the, give us a brief about what their, how their businesses performed during the quarters, uh, what any qualitative or quantitative changes which have happened. Uh, that typically goes on in the first half of the day uh, till 12. At 12 o'clock, we typically get a lunch. Um, Eating lunch on a desk is quite normal uh, because you have so much work. So you have to eat and uh, work at the same time. And then after that, uh, whatever changes have been made, uh, you know, whatever information we get from the clients, uh, it's typically that we have to update in our models, uh, create, um, you know, client-ready presentations, uh, draft analysis for our associates to review, for our managers to review. That typically takes a lot of time uh, setting up the model. Um, Excel files are really, really big. So opening those meta big Excel files also takes a good amount of time. Uh, typically get home. Um, so that's typically what happens throughout the day because your staff will probably, with their portfolio valuations in one quarter, over 100 plus investments. So in uh, a typical typical day, you're probably valuing and going over, say, at least 10 to 15 investments. Um, so, you know, you're typically busy throughout the day. Um, Right now, since I'm just starting off quarter three, um, I, I get in around seven o'clock, but I know by speaking to the other analysts coming next week, that seven o'clock is going to turn into midnight, maybe two, maybe one o'clock. So that's that's when typically uh, things get a little rough, but you know you should be ready for that. And if you actually enjoy what you're doing, um, it doesn't seem that hard. Okay, okay. That's, that's interesting. And, and thank you for, for giving us that detail. So, Throughout any single day, you're evaluating, evaluating 10 to 15 investments. Yeah. Now, is, what kind of investment are these? Are, are these in, uh, real estate, equity, purely stocks, index funds? What, what, what kind of investment? So it's typically level three assets, level two and level three assets, which are basically mostly debt with certain uh, equity. So debt as in revolvers, term loans, mezzanine debt, uh, you know, stuff like that, which... Uh, does not assets which do not have a market value like you can like just for example uh, the value of apple you can go on yahoo finance and check the price that is the true value of apple which is currently trading uh but for these kind of uh, asset classes there is no true value you have to come up with the value so that's what we do uh in terms of equity there is if there's a warrant attached to a particular deal as a sweetener you value that uh, you roll forward the uh, you know, the, the changes which have happened in those asset classes from the previous quarter to the current quarter, uh, that takes a, that takes up a majority of our work. Then there are certain certain items which uh, are typically uh, related to, you know, private equity funds, hedge funds, the way, and while working through this, you get to actually analyze how 
these professionals in the buy side think about investments. So, which is something uh, which is very, very, very crucial, if, especially if you're interested in that side of things. So, typically, level two and level three assets, uh, mostly debt uh, and a mixture of debt and equity. Okay. Now, I, I would assume that anyone interested in becoming a value, a portfolio valuation analyst, should do their own homework, their due diligence, and really yeah. understand the difference between level one, level two, level three type yeah. of assets if they yeah. want to work in the industry. Yeah. What would you say is the most exciting part of what you're doing right now? Ex most exciting part of what I'm doing is just learning, to be honest, because uh, I was thrown, because when I came to this industry, I, you know, I thought that I'd be uh, valuing mostly equities, but turns out it was the opposite. Uh, the debt markets, which people do not realize, it's, it's as big or probably bigger than the equities market. And that's where a lot of uh, actual play happens within the industry. So that was something which is very new to me. Um, and just learning, you know, how uh, important organization is, how important, uh, how professional you have to be in this industry. You can't just, you know, draft up uh, mediocre analysis and send it to an associate. You know, how what's the importance of footnotes? Uh, you know, because every line item is it's important. And if you're changing that, um, that cell, you have to make sure that you know where you're getting that information so that when the associate reviewing that model knows uh, also where to track that information. Mm -hmm. uh, learning the shortcuts in Excel. Uh, everybody, every college graduate says that they're proficient in Excel until you come in the industry and then you realize that you're not. <laughs> <laughs> so just, you know, just these things and learning how uh, this industry, how fast this industry moves and how you have to be really organized, uh, manage your time to actually keep up with it. Uh, meeting great, really, really smart people. Uh, because once, you know, when you've gone through this mentoring program, when you've, you know, passed a few classes in college, you think, oh, yeah, you know, I'm, a, I'm a great finance guy. But when you actually come into this industry, you realize how smart people are, how deals are carefully structured, uh, the level of attention to detail, which actually goes on in this industry, it's, it's amazing. So your personal Personal growth is a lot, which is very interesting right now for me. So I'm learning a lot. I, I and, and thank you for that. Look, I think something that is missing in this, especially in academia, is the importance of professional development, learning yes, professional skills, and putting students in a position where they are becoming professionals sooner yep. rather than later. Yep. When you're working with 10, 15 years uh, uh, professionals in the industry, they don't have time to waste. Yep. They don't want to babysit you. You are expected to understand the gravity of the work that you're doing. Mm -hmm. And they, and you also have to stand, understand the role that you're playing, especially when you're entering uh, for the yep. first time. You're the ones that are going to be doing most of the heavy lifting. Yep. And what would allow you to be more efficient and catch up to someone with 10 or 15 years of experience is really becoming efficient in your work. And that, that could mean, you know, being a master at Excel, knowing how to put together presentations, knowing how to think like the client. Essentially, you should be making the role of their job of your associate and managing director easier. Yes, that's it. That's exactly it. And yes. for whatever reason, Many uh, uh, first-year analysts do not understand that. Um, and this is where I feel that there's a big disconnect between academia and the professional yeah. world. And in between is what we've been able to create with the analyst prep program to accelerate that development and giving students the opportunity to develop these professional skills so that when you guys get the opportunity to perform at the big leagues, which is top tier investment bank, top tier hedge funds, top tier private equity firms, you're able to perform. It's like it's like when you get an offer at Hulahan Lockheed, you are a first round draft pick, right? That's how you have to That's see. Exactly. Yeah, and you're playing out the big leagues at, at this point. Um, so I think that's a really good, good example that, that you share in terms of professionalism, which is something that once you're in the industry, if you're not ready for it, you're going to be shocked. And, and I think it's going to yeah. be a shock if you've never yeah. And there's a steep learning curve which comes with being in this industry. And uh, if you want to do well and if you, uh, you know, want to grow in this industry, you have to keep up with it. And uh, 
it's the the main job of an analyst is basically to take as much work away from an associate and make their life as easy as possible. And I mean, to be on like like for example, when you shared um, the gap between academia and the professional world, like colleges do not even have like business schools, for example, do not even have an Excel course. Like they do have an Excel course, you know, there'll be an Excel boot camp or something like that. But these professors, they know they've been in this industry. Some of them are retired professionals. They know what what it takes, how important Excel is, or how important what what's the importance of these shortcuts. In exams, people are still using calculators, like manual calculators. You do not need that. It's it's old school tradition. But now, like, but they should have full blown Excel courses. Like, there should be like ninety second modeling exercises. Like during our training, we had we had to like there was there were like ten ten different uh, tasks which we have to do, which we had to do, and uh, we had to do all of that within ninety seconds. And for that, the first day, and I thought I was good at Excel. First day, it took everyone at least five minutes to do it and by the end of that we were able to do it within 90 seconds so that 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 speed makes turns your 2 a.m nights into 12 a.m nights your 2 a.m nights into 10 a.m 10 p.m nights so that's where things differ well i mean look it's 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 interesting that you mentioned that because this brings back a lot of memories for my days when i first started in m a at credit suisse the first day when we joined our group we were supposed to build the three statement model yeah we couldn't go home until we finished that model. Yep. Um, so I know exactly what you're talking about, um, just just this firsthand. Uh, you know, for for students in our analyst program, you know, tell us a little bit more about your developmental process from your freshman year, sophomore, junior, and senior year. What did what did that look like for you? Because to get a full time offer is not easy, right? And and, and most undergraduate students they miss the opportunity if they don't start early. So yeah. help us understand more. What did your freshman year look like? What steps did you take your sophomore year and then your junior year to put you in a position to receive a full-time offer? So um, freshman year, to be honest, completely honest, I did not even know what an income statement looked like. I did not know what balance sheet was. I just knew that uh, I was interested in finance because uh, numbers were something which came easy, easier to me than other people. Um, so I thought that, you know, finance was uh, the way to go and Emory had a great business school. So I thought, yeah, let's try finance out, but did not know uh, any accounting, did not know any, uh, uh, you know, did not take any financial classes, finance classes, did not know what an income statement was, what a balance sheet was, nothing. Uh, Come in sophomore year, when things started ramping up, you know, I heard seniors talk about to how important junior year internships are for if you want to land a job in, within, in your senior year. So I started scouting. I started earlier on than most other people. Uh, you just have to be ahead of the curve because uh, I was an interna- I'm an international student. So I anyway have a disadvantage over uh, American students and people who have green card or a U.S. passport. Um, so I had to start early. Um, I did not know where to look. Uh, first thing which people generally, generally people do is through their clubs, uh, you know, get involved in campus within finance clubs. That's where the foundation builds. So that's it's the same thing which I did. Over there, um, I got introduced to uh, Romero Mentoring. Initially, to be honest, I thought, you know, it was going to be another mentoring program, which is, you know, there on, on the website. And so I was like, okay, fine. What's the harm in applying? Let's just apply. Uh, the moment I received my first interview, uh, I knew this was not going to be an easy walk because uh, because I'd written a few, I'd, I'd glorified my resume. And uh, when, when you asked me certain questions about what I had done, I could not answer. And, I, I, and you were very, very good in uh, detailing out uh, what the answer should have been, how to think about things, you know, how to actually... Uh, I remember one of the questions which you asked me was uh, if you had to open up a coffee shop in New York City, what are the things which you would look at? Uh, how would you model it and stuff like that? And I had no idea about it. Uh, but the way you replied, you, the way you taught me about it, I knew that you know this was something which was great and uh, would definitely teach me a lot. Uh, the second round was, I think, uh, financial modeling, building a full three-state model. 
and that time also I did not know what an income statement looked like. So, um, you know, just not knowing what an income statement look, looks like to building a three statement financial model, it's a jump. Um, so that I did, I did, did remember mentoring uh, all through my, from, from my sophomore year to my junior year summer. Uh, then I think I got involved with you guys uh, full time in building up the, the company, uh, became an equity research analyst, uh, you know, uh, learned a lot for doing our Tuesday calls when we used to talk about the stock market, um, about the industry, uh, you know, learning and being hands-on with the business, learning how a business actually functions, what it takes to grow a startup. Uh, so, yeah, and uh, then uh, I was still starting for other job uh, opportunities, still networking on the side. Uh, and now, uh, now that, that I was in my junior year, the level of exposure which I had gotten was far more than any of my peers because of environment, because I worked on uh, names like Tesla, Amazon, Apple, Microsoft, built out equity research reports with them. And, and repo reports which look like a J.P. Morgan report, a Goldman Sachs report, a Hulahan Loki report, like that, that, that level of professionalism, knew what DCF was in and out, knew what, um, you know, comparable companies looks like, all the valuation methodology. So the growth which I had through this program was tremendous and really, really helpful in uh, understanding intricacies of uh, how a model functions. And that really helped me in my interview process. Um, so that was that was something which um, which was something which was very very helpful. And Romero mentoring has been a great great uh, has been a considerable portion of my professional experience. And thanks to Mr. Romero that I am where I am right now. And this is one way for me to thank uh, him, you know, by coming back and uh, you know helping other students as well. Okay, Th thank you for for sharing that, and I think that's quite interesting. Look, so freshman year, I guess we could sum it up. No, no, no technical skills, really, not having any idea about the finance industry, but you have the interest. Yes, you wanted to pursue it. Sophomore year, you got involved with student clubs. You started doing a little bit more homework. You found Romero Mentoring. You applied. We uh, uh, accepted you into the analyst prep program. And that's really where you started to develop more of the technical skills. Then your junior year, I, I, I do recall we got to work together where you were part of our uh, growth strategies team on campus, helping us grow. You got the opportunity to, to see what's it like to work at a startup in the ed tech space. You also got the opportunity to write research reports at a, at a very sophisticated level. And that continued to develop your technical skills. And having that entire experience, sophomore and junior year, is what gave you perhaps that foundation to be able to excel during the interview process your senior year at Hula for Hula Khan Lahti. Yep, that's 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 the best way you could. I could not have said it better. I could not have summarized it better. So that's that's typically it. And uh, with if you come into an interview with that kind of experience, with that kind of uh, knowledge. Uh, it's very hard for them to reject you because uh, that kind of knowledge not is close enough to what a first year analyst has. So it's it's very very important uh, and it definitely differentiates you from uh, and sets you apart from uh, the other applicants who may not have that. Even even if they come from you know the Harvards and the Yales and you know all sorts of glorified Ivy League universities, uh, if you have that kind of knowledge, there's an employer, a smart employer would pick you over those those people. Uh -huh. Here's something that I say to many of the students that we apply to. It's like, look, you obviously have the target schools, right? These are the Ivy League schools. And you have the non-target school. I, myself, personally, I went to a non-target school, right? I went to one of the CUNYs. I went to Baruch Hall. But one thing that no one took away from me was my effort. No one yep. could away from me the amount of work that I put in. So I took the initiative yeah. to learn everything that I could have learned on my own. I took the initiative and I started my own investment banking uh, portfolio management club back at Baruch College. I was uh, one of the officers of the investment banking club. So I controlled the amount of effort that I put in. Yeah. That is still true today, right? Yeah. Program that we've created is really meant to open doors. It's meant to give you yeah. 
technical skills, the relevant professional experience, help you become a professional sooner rather than later. And when you're going through the interview process and you stack up both candidates, one from the non-target school, that is a Romero mentoring candidate, and one from a target school, it could be a Harvard, it could be a Yale, it could be a Wharton, but not having the technical skill set, it's day and night when you get to speak to both candidates. And then yep. as the interviewer, you're asking yourself, which one is the higher risk candidate? Which one will yep. I be working with? From a technical skill standpoint, check. From a personality standpoint, check. From a professionalism standpoint, check. check. Attitude, work ethic. You want to be able to check all the boxes. So yep. that's what we've essentially been able to create. And, and you are a great example of that, just like many of the other students that we've uh, worked with. And it's really about you taking the effort. It's about you yep. putting the work. It's about you going through the experience and not second guessing yourself. And that's something that I see a lot of students is that they second guess themselves. You know, an opportunity is presented to them, but they start questioning it and they manage to talk themselves out of those opportunities. It's being in a it's being in your comfort zone. It's literally like that. Yeah, a lot of people resist change and when change in fact is good for them people resist it so uh, you have to get out of your comfort zone you can't you know be stuck in your college dorm rooms with your friends uh, partying at partying at night you know do attending yeah. your normal classes you can't do that if you yeah. want to actually make a dent uh, in the industry yeah yeah you you, you got to put yeah. in the work there's there's no yeah. there's no shortcut the only shortcut that you can have is investing in your professional education, right? It's yeah. finding other people that have 10, 15 years of experience and you're learning from them. That's how you make yep. people forward and you manage to save time, but you have to put it mm -hmm. in work. Um, that is one of the I things mean, that I've learned as well. Even, even at, the, at your office, even at the workplace, once you've gotten the job, um, you know, the work which you've done, the work, the, your general job description, anyone can do it. Like the person next to you can also do that job. You, you're hired to do that job, yes, of course. But the way you become indispensable at your firm is if you do something beyond your job description. If you take initiative, if you become a self-starter, you know, even if it's a small thing like organizing a team building event, you know, that's, that's a step which nobody else is taking and which actually grows your team. That's as small as something like that could be. And that goes a long way in uh, showing to your officers, to your colleagues that, you know, you you actually care about, you you actually are able to take risks and you're a self-starter and you actually care about the people around you and mm -hmm. the work which you do. It's, so, it's, so it's, it's really about just being proactive, right? It's just being proactive, yep. taking initiative. Yeah. Okay. That's Good. exactly Good, good. Um, you know, the, the other thing I wanted to ask you is, you know, what skills or characteristics do you think are essential for someone to pursue a career in finance? Uh, first of all, the most important skill is organization. I cannot stress that enough because you are getting probably close to 100 emails a day from different clients, from different associates, from different uh, managers about different things. If you do not have a place for each of these emails in your in your folders, in your subfolders, you are going to have a tough time because, for example, four months down the line, if auditors ask you, where did you get that information from? And it, it's taking you two hours to reply to that email. That's that's not a good look. You have to be organized for like and plus it's just it's just good, clean work hygiene to be organized, to have things in where they're supposed to be in the folder so that it's easily accessible for a person uh, who's coming after you as well, so that he can take uh, he can he can take things forward from where you left off. Uh, that's first thing. Time management, the second thing. Uh, everybody says that, but it's actually very important because, as I mentioned, if you're getting work, if you're getting assigned on 10 to 15 investments a day, uh, if you're working on close to 100 investments a quarter, you need to have you need to know how to manage time and manage time not just in terms of work but outside of work as well. Like you have you should have a life outside of work as well. Like take the time to you know go to the gym, take the time to 
uh, you know speak to your parents speak to your friends socialize because that that really detaches you from work and helps you in fact uh, perform better at work if you're constantly thinking about work it becomes monotonous it, it takes away your brain power so uh, if you actually want to perform work you need to uh, take the time out and do something which is not related to work uh thirdly just being professional as you said uh you cannot when so one of the things which we do is once the model is built we uh send right a cover email which is an industry practice uh if suppose for example you were in college if you were to send a professor uh, an excel file you would just attach an excel file because it's an easier work to do uh but Right, just taking that extra extra step to writing co- cover email for that investment for that for the stuff which you've done shows that uh, you know you're valuing the the other person's time as well. Just jotting down the key points from the report, just jot, jotting down what changes have been made quarter over quarter. So just being professional uh, in in general goes a long way. So I think these three things are probably the most important uh, when it comes to you know growing in this industry and actually performing well. So, being organized, time management, and being a professional. Yep. Okay. Any advice to students in the analyst prep program here at Romero Mentoring? You will hear a lot of well when you're going through the recruiting process. You will hear a lot of no's. So stick with it. You just have to be right once. You just need one yes to actually you know make it in the industry. So stick to it. Do not quit. Uh, it's very tempting to quit. um and if you stuck with it till now uh then you're probably going to get it and especially you since you're part of such a great program just just be patient uh second of all uh do while you're doing the analyst prep program actually um uh, think within do some uh do some thinking and see if this industry is really for you you know a lot of people in the freshman sophomore year they've seen a lot of movies about finance they they glorify this industry a lot they see the fancy offices uh you know they see the the fancy client dinners that doesn't come at this level that doesn't come at that this level so if you if you're sitting in the office at 2 a.m. at in a skyscraper in new york it doesn't matter how beautiful this office is you want to get back home and sleep so all of this if you're thinking about this industry like that that's the wrong way to think about this industry do not think about the external factors yes what this industry can definitely add to you is credibility to your own name if you come from this industry and if you say join some other industry or even you know start your own business um you become very organized you become a self starter you become a high functioning worker because that's what this industry requires you to be is uh allows you to have tough conversations allows you to look become very analytical uh in the way you th- see things um so it definitely improves your personality work ethic uh just you as a person but if you're looking at it from all the glory which the media portrays it as then then you should definitely look at something else <laughs> maybe uh, actually at that level no no industry does give gives that kind of glory like everything is you have to really get your hands deep in the mud uh and work uh, hard <laughs> to achieve that kind of status and i don't think i don't even think that it comes at an md level it's just the wrong perception of uh, what the media portrays to sell their movies so mm-hmm. definitely mm-hmm. know what you want to do and within within finance as well know what you want to do like investment banking sounds a lot of fun um but speak to analysts speak to people as to what they actually do on a daily basis and see if this aligns with what you want to do because a lot of times you realize that it's not something that you want to do i look at I, i think that's that's great advice um in from my own experience i have noticed that the media seems to amplify yeah. and really put under the microscope stories and deals that are the 1% or less than 1% yeah. and they tend to sensationalize it they tend to uh uh for lack of a better word blow it up yeah the world to see because of the entire media promotion machine yep. but you're only looking at the headline yeah you don't see the amount of work that the junior level professional added 
to make that deal happen. Yeah. That is hundreds of work hours each week, being able to sort out financials on a spreadsheet, yeah. being able to turn comments on a presentation, being able to organize the document in a data room, being able to reply to hundreds of emails, yep. staying up to three, four o'clock in the morning, flipping to pitch books, being yep. sleep deprived, having to go and get coffee for the entire team, having to book the trap. I mean, guys, it's, yeah. it's, it's a, I don't want to say it's not a glorified uh, junior analyst role, but <laughs> what, what's important is the amount of responsibility that you are getting exposed to as a 21, 22 year old, where you're entrusted with highly sensitive information on deals that are worth billions of dollars. And which impact almost a lot of a lot of people, which impact human normal humans like us. Uh, those the, the deals which you're working on definitely, you know, because a lot of people are investing in the stock market. For example, in my scenario, if I value a company with at a if I if I make a mistake in the valuation of a company, that affects you. That affects you who are buying the company because that's what the judge that's that's the fundamentals which I provide that you are using to invest in the company. Mm -hmm. So it's very very sensitive information. Uh, very highly uh, you have you need to be really highly responsible and look at it in the macro picture um, to see how the work which you're doing is affecting so many people in different ways, and you need to be really responsible for that. Yeah, yeah, and look, it's it's a lot of responsibility. And unfortunately, you know, the media doesn't put a lot of light into that. But when you're a serious professional, you know that the hard work, the tedious work behind closed doors that nobody gets to see has to be done. Yep. Um, and you're obviously being trusted with a lot of confidential information. And it's also a career where you're developing a lot of skill set that does provide upward mobility. Yep. Um, I don't know of any other industry that as a 21, 22 year old, you're getting this type of responsibility. It, it's kind of like dog years, right? Yep. One year in a finance role at a top tier firm, like for example, where you're at right now, Aditya, is the equivalent of probably five years of professional experience in a non-finance role yep. at any other organization, yep. right? So right now you're paying your dues, right? You're putting in the work, but yep. that is the equivalent of maybe five years for someone else yep that may spend it in corporate finance at a middle market corporate firm, right? Working in their accounting department, working in their corporate finance department. Um, that is the way I looked at the industry when I first got my start. I wanted to do yep. M&A specifically for the technical skills, the responsibility, the exposure that I was going to be able to, to have. And I knew it was just a foundation and a stepping stone for something else. And, and, and yep. today now I'm able to pass all this knowledge to, to the next generation of, of, of analysts uh, in the industry. Um, and one of the reasons why I'm able to be very efficient in terms of what I do is because of those analyst skills, is because I'm able to be to very that. organized. Yep. I was just going to come to that. I mean, even if you, since you've changed roles, uh, now you become an entrepreneur. For an entrepreneur who does not have these skills, it's very hard to grow at the rate which yeah. you grow. Uh, so that is definitely something uh, to look at because the soft skills, uh, the technical skills which you're going to learn um, are tremendous in this industry. So, and also one thing which I would like to advise people is um, that once you come in this industry, uh, focus on learning. Uh, you know, do not focus on, you know, how much you're getting paid, uh, what the person at the same role at the other bank is getting paid and stuff like that. Yeah, money matters. But what matters more than that is the learning which you're getting. If you think your firm is not teaching you uh, to the amount that uh, the other firm is teaching someone else, then okay, then you could probably sh think about moving. But learn, focus on learning, which is the most important thing, because these are your building as foundational years. And if you have the learning uh, under your belt, and if you know what you're talking about, if you have the technical skills, if you're able to analyze a deal from uh, uh, from the perspective of a client, from the perspective of a managing director at the firm who's had 20, 30 years of experience. That comes way more uh, when you're 25, 26 um, than uh, earning a couple 10, 20 grand early on and the learning is not that good. Mm -hmm. Look, that's, that, that's great advice. And, and that's actually one of our guiding principles in Romero Mentoring is yeah. always learn, keep innovating, keep improving. Great. Yeah.
All right, Aditya. Well, look, I, I really appreciate you taking out the time to be part of our alumni chat series. I well, hope that I've been able to do a good job because I know the, the, the first initiative ones, you were the one hosting them. Yep. I hope it gave you a, a good, yes. uh, it, it gave you a good experience to yes. be able to uh, conduct these interviews, which I'm pretty sure the skill set that you've developed is definitely carrying through yep. in, in your current job. So thank you for taking the time. I appreciate you. And for everyone in the Romero Mentoring Analyst Prep Program, uh, make sure you take notes. Make sure that you understand it's, it's really about developing professional skills, developing uh, the skill set that will enable you to be successful at your next internship, when you are recruiting for full-time opportunities. And then once you hit the ground running, uh, you're able to perform like a top-tier professional. So with that being said, I'll end it here, and I'll see you guys in the next one. 